great day today because it's the first time in 15 months that I've been able to even begin to get back to uh, dealing with my father's biography. Oh, well. And other things have just kept on uh, intervening. Yes. Uh, but that must be very satisfying. You <laughs> see, when I'm going to really get into it, I hope it will be. Yes. Well, Sir Eddie, we've come to the fifth talk in our interviews. Last week we reached the mid 1990s. And I wonder if we could begin today with the time when you were knighted in 1998. I wonder whether you have any recollections of the ceremony when you met the Queen. Yes, I have. Uh, some recollection of a very pleasant occasion. I want just to say that I do not know why I was knighted. The um, official statement just said for services to public international law. But there are others who also serve the subject who haven't got knighthood, so I really I have never been told why I had the good fortune to be selected. However, that happened, and very agreeable it was. Uh, the honour was announced in the Queen's Honours List in June of whichever year it was, 1989 I think, uh, uh, 1999 sorry, and uh, the actual investiture when one goes to Buckingham Palace to receive the accolade did not take place till sometime in November that year and one simply goes to the palace uh, along with a number of other recipients of honours and uh, everything is beautifully organised there is a, a master of ceremonies who has obviously uh, presided over these matters many times who gives you very explicit directions as to exactly how you should approach the Queen and then uh, turn round and face her uh, and uh, kneel down and she will then um, uh, uh, tap you with a sword and you rise and you, you bow and you back off and uh, it's all over in, in a twinkling uh, there, there's a large audience in which members of one's own family are included and then after that we all went off and had a good lunch at the Connaught sounds delightful so it was very nice uh, not <laughs> It's been a very agreeable thing to have received. It actually made no difference to one's life. And, and what is remarkable, and it's really quite amusing in a way, is the number of people who do not know how to address you. Many people go on uh, uh, addressing you as Mr. That's perfectly acceptable. I don't get in the state about that. And then there, there are others who in correspondence, instead of using the usual form, which is Sir plus your first name, uh, you just say Sir Lauterbach or something like that. But again, it doesn't matter. I think it, uh, these days it matters much less than it would have 30 or 40 years ago. But when, it is surprising, though. Well, people, it, it is in a way it's surprising, and equally in a way it's not surprising because people are just less concerned about these things now and if so, people certainly are not educated about them and one therefore just accepts it for, for the condition that it is. Well, Sir Eli, we come then to the first item on your list which is the Namibia Botswana or Kasikiri Sududu arbitration. Well that was uh, actually not an arbit arbitration, that was a an ICJ case between uh, Namibia and Botswana relating to the boundary at the eastern end of the Caprivi Strip uh, it's at the north of Botswana and the northeast of uh, Namibia. The, the subject matter of this dispute was really quite trifling. It related to the uh, where the where the boundary lay uh, in the uh, Chobe River. Uh, at a certain point, the, the river divides and goes round a small island, uh, Kasikili Island, which is hardly bigger than a couple of football pitches. 
but each side attached importance to having its title to that island recognized and so they eventually uh, agreed to go to the ICJ as the Namibian, Namibian team on which I served was led by uh, Professor Abe Chase of the Harvard Law School. Abe Chase was a very uh, striking character, a very clever man indeed, very quick. He had been legal advisor of the State Department during the Kennedy uh, regime in the United States, then he returned to Harvard. And quite how he got involved in the case, I don't know. But uh, we, we were a very agreeable team, which also included a man, a professor whose name is just slipping my mind at the moment, uh, who, who had close connections in the Libya, but was a professor up at uh, Warwick University. Oh, it's silly of me not to remember his name because he's a very fine man. And uh, uh, he was the, the link with the Namibians. In the preparation of the case, we met occasionally in London at the Namibian High Commission, and uh, Abe dominated the proceedings. Uh, it didn't bother me particularly. I, I was assigned my bit of the case, and I just got on and did it. Uh, and we gradually uh, got ourselves ready for the ICJ hearings, which were very straightforward. And uh, eventually the court decided that the island belonged to Botswana on the basis that the main channel of the river ran north of the island and thus brought the island into uh, Botswana territory. I was wondering whether there was any evidence that the court looked at maps that might have been used or produced by the South African Defence Force during the time of its military activity against Angola. The court didn't look at maps produced by the South African Defence Force, at least not that I can recall, but uh, it used maps a great deal and went back to try and figure out where exactly the boundary makers who sat in London or Berlin uh, thought the line was going. And as they didn't help us all that much. But it, it was a, a very interesting experience. And, uh, and of course, it takes one back into 19th century colonial history in a very specific manner. Very interesting. I also wondered whether during the proceedings there was cognizance of the dispute between the Caprivi people and the central government in Namibia. No, that was not involved in the matter at all. No, we were just focused on that one small point of the, the boundary in the region of the Chobe River, uh, of the Kaskili Island. So where were you based, Sir Eli, when you were actually there? Oh, well, Did you go to Kasani? We, we, we um, flew into the capital of uh, Namibia. Kasani. Um, hmm? uh, Namibia, Vintuk. Vintuk, yes. yes. And, uh, and we stayed in a hotel there for a night, and then we, we were put into a plane, and we flew out to the, the region. It was quite a long way away. And I think we spent one night in the region just uh, surveying, uh, and during the day we surveyed the area, just become familiar with it. We flew back to Windhoek, and I, I don't suppose we were in Namibia for more than three or four days. Well, that brings us then to the next item, which is the Ligatan and Sipadan case. Well, actually, the next item would be, ah. be before that would be the uh, the Kumara Swami uh, case. That was that was a, again a very interesting one. It was really a dispute between Malaysia and the United Nations. Uh, Kumara Swami was who was a Malaysian was the Special Rapporteur of the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, and um, Malaysia uh, uh, needed to, or wanted to take proceedings against him in the Malaysian courts relating to certain conduct of his in Malaysia. 
uh, the United Nations uh, claimed that he was entitled to immunity. This was denied by Malaysia. And the question really was who was entitled to determine whether what he was doing fell within the scope of his activities as rapporteur. Malaysia maintained that it was their courts that were entitled to do that because the issue arose in the Malaysian courts. Uh, the UN uh, con contended otherwise. Well, uh, eventually the, the matter came to the ICJ and uh, in a judgment which was uh, four-fifths concerned with other matters, the court seemed to be deciding in favor of the UN. But when it came to this crucial question, which was the one around which the whole issue had begun, the court concluded that it was really for the Malaysian courts to decide that issue. Uh, and so there it was, and uh, th thereafter uh, the UN and Kumaraswamy and Malaysia worked out a solution that was acceptable to all. I see. Um, which then brings us to the Ligitan and Sipadan. Ah, Ligitan and Sipadan, that was a, a lovely case because it related to such a, a beautiful part of the world. Ligitan and Sipadan are two islands off the east coast of Borneo and uh, title to them was disputed between uh, Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. Uh, uh, Sipadan is known to the, the scuba diving fraternity in the world as one of the great uh, places to go because it is in fact a mushroom of coral that comes up from the bottom of the ocean and then flattens out into this small island. But once you uh, equip yourself with a diving gear and you go out over the edge of the island and down underneath the, the mushroom top, uh, you enter an incredibly beautiful world of multicolored fish and uh, all, all the splendor that goes with that kind of experience. Unfortunately, I couldn't share it because I wasn't much of a, a scuba diver, but uh, I did put on a, a mask and goggles and have a look underwater and I began to see what it was all about. And so the question was, to whom did the island belong? And this was a, a matter of uh, demonstrating which of the two sovereigns had exercised power over the island. And uh, Malaysia was in a position to show that people who uh, expressed their allegiance to it had uh, been uh, local rulers who had uh, given licenses, for example, for the collection of turtle eggs, that being a major uh, commodity in, in that place. And uh, eventually the court decided in favor of Malaysia. Um, certainly if I cast my mind back to other cases that you've mentioned that involve border disputes, many of them seem to have been influenced by precedents set by colonial powers. Is this because the adjudicators or the judges prefer to fall back upon old status quos rather than creating potential new disputes? I don't think one can put it quite like that. They, uh, these cases, so many of them, are uh, involved history. And the parties to them were, in, they were usually uh, states that had emerged from uh, colonial status into independence. Therefore, if one had to go back into their history, necessarily one had to go back into colonial times. So that in the case of uh, uh, Sipadan and Ligatan, one was going back into the time when Britain was the, the, the colonial power in the northern part of Borneo. Uh, and that was so, so again, with, with uh, um, Kasikili, it was a matter of looking back to see what, what Britain on the one hand and Germany on the other had done in relation to the area. It must have been very enjoyable poring over the history books and looking at the maps. Oh, it was always great fun doing those cases because it took one into a world into which one had not otherwise entered. Yes. And especially, as you mentioned earlier, looking at the maps and seeing if they help one. The court has taken uh, a fairly 
uh, conservative or restrained uh, view of the value of maps. Uh, they, they serve on the whole to uh, support rather than to be the main prop of, of, of a case. The case has to be established otherwise, and the maps provide some supportive uh, guidance. this brings us then to FAMFA on your list. I wish I could remember what FAMFA was about. Um, let's pass FAMFA okay. till it okay. comes back to mind. All, all, all I could know is that it was a, a local Nigerian oil company. Oh, that's right. Yes. And the reason that I, I don't remember it is that it really came to nothing. Uh, a, a bit of time was spent by myself as, as an arbitrator uh, managing the case, but eventually it was settled and uh, there was no decision. Uh, so we go on to the next case of that period, which was the dispute between Pakistan and India relating to the shooting down by India of a Pakistan naval aircraft that was flying over Pakistan territory, I believe, at the time. Where exactly was it? was it? Was it over a disputed border zone? No, that was not over a disputed border. No, it was just an episode. That is to say, this uh, Pakistan plane was simply shot down by the, by the Indians. And uh, the, the case was, in a sense, uh, doomed to failure because Pakistan, of course, was the, the complainant. Uh, India was uh, uh, disinclined to allow the matter to be uh, judicially... Uh, considered, and the basis for compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ was very weak, and I so advised uh, the Pakistan government, but they felt, I think uh, understandably felt, that the matter was so serious for them that they were obliged to pursue it, even though the prospect of success was small. And so uh, we started proceedings in the ICJ. Uh, in, invoking the compulsory jurisdiction acceptance of India, but that a actually excluded uh, disputes between members of the Commonwealth, and that's why the court could not exercise jurisdiction, and in due course the, the case was decided uh, against Pakistan. Uh, the court uh, upheld India's preliminary objection, and the merits were never reached. Despite Pakistan's argument that the, you know, of Yes, despite all Pakistan's arguments. And, uh, Very interesting. Um, well, that brings us then to the new millennium, and the well, first item here is the Southern Bluefin Tuna case. Yes, I should just perhaps uh, intervene at this point to say that we are focusing uh, very heavily on on my practice, as if there was no uh, other activity. But I should mention the fact that I had a very enjoyable, albeit relatively short, interlude when I resumed lecturing at the London School of Economics. Uh, Rosalind Higgins had been elected as the British judge at the International Court of Justice, and she took up her position, and there was a gap between her departure from LSE and the uh, f following academic year when Professor Gre Christopher Greenwood uh, uh, took up. And so I, I gave uh, about uh, half the course for that year at LSC and greatly enjoyed it. I have no doubt in my mind that if one's going to be a capable of international... In <coughs> if one's going to be a capable international lawyer, one really has to be a teacher of the subject. It's only by teaching that you really uh, keep up or keep abreast of the whole range of topics embraced within international law. Otherwise, you become committed to relatively small points that happen to be the subject of litigation. So going back to LSE was, for me, a, a very enjoyable and useful experience. So now we come, as you were suggesting, to the period from 2000 onwards. And th th that involved a very interesting and uh, controversial case between uh, Australia and Japan relating to the taking by 
a Japanese fisherman of southern bluefin tuna in the seas uh, around Australia. <coughs> and this was a, a case that was brought not before the International Court of Justice, but before uh, arbitration under the Law of the Sea Convention of 1982. It was a, a distinguished tribunal of which uh, Judge Schwebel formerly a judge of the International Court of Justice, formerly indeed a president of the International Court of Justice, was the uh, presiding arbitrator. And the <coughs> uh, Japanese who were being uh, pursued by the Australians took the position that this was not a matter that fell within the jurisdiction of the law of the sea tribunal. So that was the first issue that had to be decided. And <coughs> the the contention of the Australians was uh, that uh, it fell directly within the terms of the, the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, uh, and J Japan's position was no, that, there were, uh, that the Law of the Sea Convention was not the ex only uh, possible source of jurisdiction at that time in respect to this class of matter. And uh, the, the, the case really turned on the fact that quite a number of conventions, or I should say bilateral agreements, had been concluded since 1982 between states that were also parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, in which provision had been made specifically for arbitration of disputes, thus uh, countering the Australian contention that the Law of the Sea Convention was the sole possible source of jurisdiction. Uh, and the uh, tribunal eventually decided in favor of Japan uh, and, uh, and denied that it had a jurisdiction. This led to quite a lot of controversy and of course it was a concern to environmentalists for whom this was a fairly early significant international case. Uh, now the environmentalists have of course pursued education in other spheres since then. Uh, for, for an international lawyer, if I can put, this, put it this way, of the old school such as myself, environment was a, a really quite new issue. I mean, when I first studied international law back in uh, 1950, uh, nobody talked about environmental problems. That wasn't a, a, an issue. And it only gradually crept into the uh, body of international law over the next uh, two decades. When I went to Australia in 1975 uh, and became the deputy leader of the Australian delegation to the Law of the Sea Conference, I was confronted by environment as a major issue. And uh, as you know, uh, environmental matters are dealt with in the Law of the Sea Convention. But by then it was becoming an issue that could not be neglected. So uh, that was Southern Bluefin Tuna, uh, and that was followed by an interesting case about, uh, I I within ICSID, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Now, <coughs> this was a case brought by a Belgian gentleman called Gruzla, uh, and Gruz it was a case brought against Malaysia within ICSID. Uh, he claimed uh, that he had bought shares in a Luxembourg investment trust that specialized in investment in Malaysia. Malaysia had, uh, in view of a currency crisis by which it was confronted, uh, had suspended uh, dealings in such shares. And Gruzlan claimed that this was a violation of a bilateral investment treaty between uh, Belgium and Luxembourg on the one hand and Malaysia on the other. Now, the case did not at first seem of any particular importance, but then it was recognized by the Malaysian government that if Guzlan were to succeed in his claim, that would open the door to many other claims against Malaysia and possibly in due course against other countries. But anyway, uh, <coughs> that if Guzlan succeeded, this would open the way to subsequent proceedings uh, affecting 
the ability of states to, to, to deal with their economic affairs and, and could lead to very heavy uh, claims. Uh, so uh, Malaysia uh, objected to the jurisdiction of the Exit Tribunal on the ground that this was really a case that was not made in relation to an investment in Malaysia. Uh, the explanation of that position was that Rusla had bought shares in a Luxembourg investment trust and so his investment had been in, in Luxembourg and the fact that the Luxembourg investment trust had subsequently placed his money in Malaysia uh, did not uh, generate a claim under the bilateral treaty and that was uh, the holding of the tribunal. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a relatively straightforward case decided by a, a single arbitrator. Well, that brings us to the Eritrea-Ethiopia Boundary Commission, and I find it very interesting that both you, Sir Ali, and your father, Sir Hirsch, should have Eritrea-Ethiopia as issues in international law. Yes, I think, uh, uh, Leslie, the, the connection between his involvement and, and, and mine is really rather uh, distant. It, it, it's true that uh, in the period before the war, he, he viewed the Ethiopian situation of the Italian invasion of Abyssinia as a manifest violation of international law and a reflection of the weakness of the League of Nations. He also had another, uh, uh, that was an academic view, he also had another small connection w with uh, uh, Abyssinia in that when Emperor Haile Selassie left uh, Abyssinia, uh, as, a, as a refugee monarch, uh, he, he, he came to Cambridge and uh, sought some uh, in instruction on international law from my father. But that's as far as he was ever involved in matters as Ethiopian. But uh, <coughs> my involvement in the EEBC was an entirely different and, and, and a very uh, uh, demanding and uh, interesting character. Uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia uh, had fought a very bloody war uh, in the period 1998 to 2000 in which many thousands of lives were lost. Very tragic. There should have been a war over, uh, over the boundary between them. It's a thousand kilometers long the boundary stretching from Djibouti in the east uh, westwards uh, virtually to the Nile. Now, eventually, the two sides were prevailed upon to, to enter into an agreement by which the hostilities were stopped. And it was agreed that the dispute about the boundary would be submitted to arbitration. The agreement provided that there should be a commission, a boundary commission of five members, two to be appointed by each side and the four members thus appointed were to select a president. Uh, Ethiopia uh, chose Sir Arthur Watts and Judge Ajibola, Sir Arthur Watts being, of course, a, a very prominent British international, having been legal advisor of the Foreign Office, and then after he left, retired from that position, he entered private practice and was active in arbitration uh, as an arbitrator and litigation as counsel. Uh, judge Ajibola had been, uh, uh, who was a Nigerian, uh, had been a judge of the International Court and was a greatly respected African international lawyer. The Eritreans uh, chose two prominent American international lawyers, Judge Schwebel, whom I already mentioned, who had been president of the ICJ and was a very experienced judge and arbitrator, and Professor Michael Reisman of Yale Law School, who's also a very uh, active arbitrator and litigator, a uh, very an outstandingly uh, fine international lawyer. And the four of them got together and selected me as the prospective president and offered me the position, which I was glad to accept, though I did not realize when I accepted it that it would be quite as 
arduous an appointment as it turned out to be. In the agreement, the parties had rather unusually, in fact I think uniquely, uh, required that the Boundary Commission should not only delimit the boundary, and by delimitation we mean uh, determining in words where the boundary line runs, but should also demarcate the boundary, which means putting pillars in the ground to show where the delimitation line actually ran. I'd say involved putting pillars in the ground because that was the approach generally understood by the word a demarcation, but as I'll explain in a moment, that was not how we were able to finish it up. And they also prescribed a very short time limit of six months within which this work was to be done. Well, that was a quite unrealistic approach for the subject. You can't determine a boundary dispute uh, in six months uh, unless uh, things were, are very different from what they were in this case. And I don't myself know of any boundary dispute so quickly resolved. So, uh, <laughs> more particularly, if you have to demarcate the boundary as well. And when you think this was going back to the last century? Well, this, yes, again, this, this problem goes back into uh, the, the period of Italian rule over Eritrea and uh, Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopia's position too. So, we did our very best to produce a delimitation a decision uh, quickly. And we were able to produce one by April 2002, having begun in February 2001. So it took us just a little over the year to do the delimitation of this thousand mile long boundary. And uh, the parties had undertaken in their uh, agreement that they would accept the decision of the Boundary Commission as binding. And when we gave the decision, both sides declared their acceptance of it. But that was when our problems began. In truth, Ethiopia did not like the decision. Uh, there was a particular section of the boundary that ran near a location called Badme. Ethiopia maintained that Badme was Ethiopian, but Badme actually lay on the Eritrean side of what of the line that was called the traditional signature of the boundary. It was a, a straight line running in a, a, a northeast southwest direction, and Badme lay on the Eritrean side. Ethiopia uh, contended that the line that we call the traditional signature, in fact, lay further to the north and west, and that would have brought Badme within the Ethiopian area. However, uh, and this was a strange feature of the case, Ethiopia did not argue specifically about Badme, and only came to a, a few uh, observations about Badme as a, an advanced stage in the exchanges of the written pleadings. In the end, the Commission concluded that the traditional signature was the correct one. And when I talk about signature, I'm not talking about names appended to a piece of paper. We're talking about uh, using the phrase loosely to describe the, the line that people were accustomed to seeing on maps. The Commission uh, concluded that the traditional signature was the one, or virtually the traditional signature was the one that was operative. And this left Badme in Eritrean territory, though Ethiopia was at that time occupying it, and in fact still does, contrary to the terms of the Commission's uh, decision. So, as I say, this was not very agreeable to, to Ethiopia, and Ethiopia uh, began raising various obstacles to the continuance of the Commission's task of demarcating the boundary. We were able to demarcate the eastern end of the boundary in um, the, the, um, uh, the desert, uh, a very hostile desert 
which includes the, the lowest and hottest part of the world. But when it came to a demarcation further to the west, uh, uh, th th there we ran into difficulties. The area was uh, being monitored or policed by a UN uh, force, uh, the United Nations mission to Eritrea and Ethiopia, which was costing a great deal of money. And that force is still there, though uh, somewhat attenuated. But from, the, from April 2002 until uh, this day, and this day we're talking now about uh, March 2008, there has been no physical demarcation of the boundary in the, in the rest of the, of the line. Now, the Commission found uh, this situation of inactivity or, or, or uh, forced inactivity uh, very troublesome. And eventually it uh, said to the parties, look, this is November 2006. Uh, we now are able, with modern methods of photography and measurement, to determine to within a meter where the boundary pillars should be placed. And so we are attaching to this statement a list of coordinates covering the rest of the boundary where the line should be. And if within one year, that is to say by the end of November 2007, the parties have not agreed on the demarcation of the physical demarcation of the boundary along that line, or have not permitted us to go and demarcate physically along that line, then that line will nonetheless stand as the boundary. So we have, a, in effect, a, a demarcation not by pillars, the, the previously uh, normal meaning of demarcation, but by coordinates. Now, there was precedent for this. There had been a demarcation by coordinates as of the, the boundary between Kuwait and Iraq following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in the, in the 90s. And so during that year we had hoped that the parties would reach some agreement on the matter, but they did not, though the Commission gave them the opportunity of doing so by uh, summoning meetings at which the parties came, but uh, Ethiopia in particular was uh, an unwilling participant. And this led Eritrea to change what had previously been a cooperative position into a non-cooperative position. And it began making the task of the Commission even more difficult. And in particular, it made difficulties for the operation of the United Nations force. So both states were uh, uh, at fault in their attitude to the Commission. So eventually, as I say, at the end of November 07, uh, the Commission uh, suspended its activity. There was nothing more it could do. And that's how things stand now. But very fortunately, uh, the ceasefire, the termination of hostilities that the parties had agreed to back in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, has held, and the parties have not uh, resumed fighting. And that's how we hope it will remain until eventually uh, a condition of peace becomes a habit and they permit the boundary to be properly illustrated by pillars. So that was the EBC. Fascinating account. It was a very, very for me, uh, a unique and fascinating uh, period in which uh, not only one was one deciding about law and facts, but for me as president, uh, I was managing a very uh, complex diplomatic relationship, yes. uh, and uh, this required uh, some sensitivity on yes. my part, uh, a sensitivity in which I was greatly aided. By my, by my colleagues' views, uh, in, including Sir Arthur Watts, who most sadly uh, died uh, shortly afterwards. Well, I say shortly afterwards, in, in November of 07. So that was the EBC. The history of that um, case really needs to be written. There are some, some points which would be of value to uh, 
future boundary matrix, but uh, when it will be ready to be written is a, is a different question. Yes. It certainly re-emphasizes the point about you know, colonial boundaries again. In this case, you know, um, a, a colonial power, Italy against a weaker Abyssinia. Well, it, it wasn't quite like that. There were three treaties and uh, other states besides Italy were involved. But it certainly involved running going back into the, the 1890s uh, to see what these treaties, which were the controlling instruments, uh, meant. It must have been so interesting. It was indeed. It yes. was indeed. So then we, uh, <coughs> uh, in parallel, in terms of time with uh, EBC, there was another very interesting arbitration between the Barbados on the one hand and Trinidad and Tobago on the other regarding the determination of the maritime boundary between those two countries. Uh, it it, it um, involved consideration of such concepts as equidistance and consideration also of the role of equity in the determination of boundaries. Uh, it, it was a, a detailed case, I won't go into it but now, but eventually the, the arbitral commission, which consisted of Judge Schwebel and Sir Arthur Watts and, and others, uh, reached a conclusion which both sides seemed to be able to, to live with. And that, that brings us now to uh, Belize. Belize. Uh, Belize is a, a long standing, again, uh, if you will, colonial matter. The only British colony in Central America. Is that right? Yes. Well, uh, it, Belize is, of course, the, the, the current name of British Honduras. Uh, and uh, <coughs> going back as far as 1859, there was a dispute between Guatemala and Britain regarding uh, the western boundary of British Honduras. Now this was resolved by an agreement in 1859 uh, and uh, so everyone had hoped the matter was settled. However, uh, it was not in the eyes of Guatemala uh, settled and Guatemala had uh, consistently been uh, raising doubts about the continuing validity of the 1859 agreement. One of the uh, grounds for the Guatemalan opposition was that the 1859 agreement had contained a provision that Britain would build a road from the border with Guatemala across British Honduras to the, to the sea, to the Caribbean. And that road had not been built. And this, uh, I think, was largely because other factors intervened, making the road unnecessary. However, uh, Guatemala has C complained about that. So uh, <coughs> the dispute uh, began to, to fester visibly in the in after um, Belize became independent and in uh, 1992 I think it was uh, I gave an opinion uh, in conjunction with again Judge Schwebel, uh, Professor uh, Francisco Orego Vicuña from Chile and uh, uh, Ambassador Rosen from Israel on, on the question of the border. And we came out quite clearly with the conclusion that uh, the, the present border was the valid legal border. But that didn't really resolve the issue because by then it had increased in uh, geographical range because Guatemala was also contending that it was entitled to certain islands and maritime areas off the coast of Belize. Uh, negotiations uh, took place between the two sides but didn't seem to get anywhere. Uh, the Organization of American States uh, involved itself and the present position is that um, there is some hope that the two sides may eventually agree that the dispute should be submitted to the International Court of Justice for a final determination, but the uh, agreement for the submission to the International Court 
has has not yet been c c concluded. So that was um, the problem of Belize, but it's gone on. You see, it's gone on from 19. Uh, my involvement in it has has gone back as far as the the preparations for the 1992 opinion. So effectively, till sometime in 1990, and it continues even today in 2000. And, and eight. Uh, Sixteen years, and it'll probably go on longer than that. Uh, so, uh, coming to the Avina case, you were co agent here, and you represented Mexico. No, I think you, you, you've got her in the wrong end of the stick. Uh -huh. um, I, I was not co agent. Uh, Avina was a case between the United States and Mexico, in which uh, Mexico was contending that the United States had failed to meet its obligations under the consular agreement uh, between the two sides <coughs> in, in um, not allowing uh, Avina, a Mexican national, being tried in the U.S. courts, access to uh, the Mexican consul. Now, I, had, I was not involved on the Mexican side of the case at all. I was merely one of the counsel that uh, uh, participated on behalf of the United States in the hearings on the preliminary objection that the United States raised uh, to uh, the Mexican uh, claim. So my involvement in that was quite short-lived and related purely to the, the technical legal point of the, of the prelimin preliminary objection. I wasn't involved in the uh, subsequent uh, substance of the case. very important case. So then we come to Pulo Batu Pute. That's a, a lovely case. Again, going right back in history. Pulo Batu Pute is the name given in Malaysia to a small rock. Again, no bigger than a football pitch, if that lying about seven miles off the coast of southern Johor in the Straits of Singapore, in the eastern uh, entrance to the Straits of Singapore. The other name for Pulo Batiputi is Pedra Branca, White Rock, because it used to be a place where birds deposited guano. Now, back in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Straits of Singapore were a very important part of the Far Eastern route from Britain to Hong Kong. And uh, Captain Horsburgh, who was the chief navigator of the East India Company, uh, drew up uh, some navigational instructions for uh, sailing from London to Hong Kong. These instructions, I may say, are contained in a most beautiful volume, which is in the University Library, accompanied by a volume of charts, wonderful pieces of cartography, and uh, were of great value in, in promoting the East India trade. When Captain Horsburgh died in about 1840, the merchants of Hong Kong felt that there should be some memorial erected uh, in his uh, honor, or in his memory. So a subscription was raised, and the money was sent to the governor of Singapore to be applied to the construction of a lighthouse to mark the eastern entrance of the Straits of Singapore, and thus be an aid to navigation, because it was quite a, a dangerous place in which to sail without that facility. And uh, so in the 1840s, the steps were taken towards the building of a lighthouse, and by 1851, a lighthouse had been constructed on Pulubatipute, and it was being run by Britain as uh, the colonial power in the area. I may say that in this case, we had to do a lot of delving into history to figure out exactly who said what and when relating to the acquisition of this island. So, 
But this island, or rock as it really is, this island, this rock, is the site of the lighthouse. And the lighthouse has been run by uh, the Singapore authorities, initially in Britain and then subsequent, uh, after independence by, by, uh, by Singapore itself. And um, the dispute arose between Malaysia and Singapore around about 1979 because Malaysia indicated on maps that the island was Malaysia, i.e. belonging to Johor, which is one of the constituent states of, of Malaysia. And uh, <coughs> One of the crucial disputed elements of fact in the case was exactly how did Britain come to occupy the island for the purpose of building the lighthouse, which meant going back to the correspondence of the 1840s to find, if one could, a letter from the governor of Singapore to the <coughs> uh, Sultan of Johor, asking him for permission to build a lighthouse. Now the letters that could be found actually asked for permission to build a lighthouse not at, on Pulau Batuputi, but on another rock nearer the Johor coast. The Sultan of Johor and the so-called Temagong, his associated ruler in the area, gave their consent. Now, Britain maintain, uh, Singapore now maintains that um, <coughs> that consent did not extend to Pulau Batu Putih itself and that, Brit that the title that Britain acquired in the late 1840s was a title by way of occupation of what is called a terra nullius, an island that had no previous sovereign. So really that was what the case was about. And uh, we await uh, the decision of the International Court even this day because uh, the substance of the case was heard in the court in November of this past year. And uh, I suppose that sometime soon the ICJ will hand down a decision. And it will be very interesting to see what it is. It will be an important decision, but one that turns largely on, on the facts. Uh, the situation being slightly complicated, by the, f by the fact that in 1953 the Singapore authorities addressed the Johor authorities with an inquiry as to whether Johor claimed the rock and uh, the answer that was given was that it did not but so uh, there's an important legal issue here as to what is the validity of that response from Johor I say we must wait and, and see what the court decides. But all these cases, as you probably realise, would take up would take quite a lot of um, time. And when they were running in parallel, one was really quite busy. And th thereafter, I became well. I had for some time previously been involved in questions relating to Cyprus the division of Cyprus, as you know, into two parts, the Turkish part in the north and the Greek part in the south. And I had been giving advice to the Turkish Cypriots and to the government of Turkey. And those issues are still alive, so I won't go into them now. It's been a great shame that the island has been divided in this way since 1974. And hopefully uh, there are signs now that uh, there may be... Uh, productive and fruitful negotiations on the subject. Uh, and then in 2006 I was honoured to be made a member of the British group of the, NAT, of the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, under the Hague uh, Conventions. Uh, each uh, uh, various countries became parties to the, uh, the statute of the permanent court of arbitration, and in the 
statute of the International Court of Justice, a role was accorded to these so-called national groups in the nomination of candidates for election to the court. So it's a matter for the British national group to nominate a candidate for election to the ICJ. And the members of the British national group at the time that I was appointed to it were uh, President Higgins, Rosalind Higgins, who is currently the president of the ICJ, uh, Lord Bingham, who is the senior law lord, and Sir Arthur Watts, and I was added to them as the fourth member. And then very sadly since then, Sir Arthur Watts has passed away and his replacement has not yet been nominated by the government. But then we had to spend uh, time together in determining who and the British candidate would be for election to the ICJ when Judge Higgins reaches the end of her term of office next year. And uh, the British National Group selected Professor Christopher Greenwood uh, as the candidate. And those elections will take place in November of this year, 2008. And we will then know how, how select, successful our nomination has been. So I, I've been engaged in that, and uh, while he was still alive, Sir Arthur was the the member who was responsible for for, for specific running the group. And uh, now that he's gone, uh, that uh, has fallen to, to, to me, which takes a certain amount of time because you've got people who are very busy and not easy to get together. But that that's an interesting experience. Will someone else be nominated to fill Sir Arthur's place? Not yet. Yeah. Somebody will be, but, but that's not for us, that's for the government. Right. The government makes the nomination of the members of the PCA. And that is how you were nominated? Yes, it was the government that nominated me to, to be a member of the PCA. But the, the whole idea is that to try and insulate the process of nomination a little bit from direct government pressure. But you know, I think this is... Uh, well, in the case of the British group, it's quite true. We do act quite independently of the government. Um, that may not be equally so uh, in other countries. Some, um, some certainly respect the, the, the idea. Others place their, their members under direct governmental pressure, or indeed their members may be uh, legal advisors of their foreign office and so on. And that brings us to the last item on my list of developments or events, and that is that I have for the last several years been engaged on the preparation of a biography of my late father, Sir Hirsch Leitbrand. And this is a, a fascinating undertaking, but unfortunately one that has fallen into a second or even third place in the light of the other commitments in which I've been involved. I'm hoping now that uh, I may be able to get back to it because it's something I'm most anxious to complete yes. before it's too late. Yes. And uh, it, it's a very interesting task. And for me, quite cathartic. I have to relive uh, yeah. the, the years uh, in which I uh, uh, was, um, the years in which I lived with my parents. Yes. Um, they were very good years. And um, so I hopefully I'll, I'll get something done in due course. Well, certainly, perhaps we should stop at this point, and next time we can talk about some people that you remember during the course of your illustrious career. And I thank you again for a fascinating interview, and look forward to resuming next week. Yes, I'd be very happy to do that because there are lots of people whom I've known and whom I would like to recall in the course of these interviews.